welcome to the uh, closing plenary. And the title of the session is Coordinating and Revitalizing Asian Growth. In the last few years, the pandemic of COVID-19 was spread all over the world, including Asia. And global economic growth uh, slowing down, and transportation and tourism sectors are heavily affected by this. But now, in a way, we are uh, in a post-COVID recovery phase, and some of the uh, uh, industries are either coming back to the uh, equal level of growth before the pandemic, or even higher. So here in Vietnam, in the recent announcement by the government, the real GDP growth, uh, growth rate uh, estimated for the third quarter of this year, July to September, was 5.33% compared to the same period last year. However, the annual GDP uh, growth rate, it might be difficult to achieve the government three year target, which is 6.5% for this year. So still something you know, has to be uh, you know, achieved more. Uh, in Japan, as well as uh, other countries in Asia, uh, during the pandemic, we had to change our lifestyle and business style in many ways. Not only wearing masks, but also working remotely or online. And these changes are continuing even after the pandemic. So we need to uh, shift ourselves to the post-pandemic new status quo. Another key word of this uh, session uh, is coordination. In mid-November, Chinese President Xi Jinping met with the US President Joe Biden in San Francisco. I understand it was the first time in six years uh, for Xi Jinping to visit the United States. And President Biden, after the conference, emphasized that the United States and China are in competition. So he reiterated that the world expects the United States and China to manage competition reasonably to prevent uh, it from conflict, confrontation, or even a new Cold War. If the pro uh, potential tension between the two countries grows more, it may affect all the Asian economy in terms of its supply chain, financing, maybe foreign direct investment, etc. It also raises the question to all of us with whom we should coordinate. In this session, we invite uh, distinguished guests from various backgrounds to the panel and we will discuss this agenda by pointing out our new challenges and trying to find ways to harmonize our common interests. So I am Tsutomu Ishii, uh, senior staff writer at Asahi Shimbun, a nationwide newspaper in Japan. I was former correspondent at Washington DC, Cairo, and London. I am moderating this session. So first, I'd like to introduce each panelist briefly and ask to speak each one of them about two, three minutes uh, for, for their initial remarks. So the first speaker, Atari Agnes Ivanadera, she is a Filipina lawyer and politician. She is currently the president and CEO of Clark Development Corporation. Since last year, I, I understand uh, you are appointed by the President Marcos. And uh, the corporation is a governmental body which oversees developing uh, the area after the Clark US Air Force Base closed down in 1991. So she was also a former cabinet member as Secretary of Justice and the President of Arroyo. Uh, so Agnes, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tom. Well, uh, Clark Development Corporation uh, actually is the estate manager. It's a government-owned corporation. It's the estate manager and the regulator of the Clark Freeport Zone, which, as uh, Tom mentioned, used to be the U.S. Air Force Base, the largest air base outside of the mainland. But now, uh, after the base agreement uh, ended, 
uh, it has been transformed into an investment destination or an industrial park. So that has been 30 years ago, and now it has emerged not just as investment uh, destination, but also as a tourist destination. Uh, right now, we have 1,170 locators, and uh, we have 137,000 workers within the zone. Uh, Clark's uh, evolution is, uh, uh, has affected the development of the region. In fact, now, the poverty rate in the region, in Region 3 and in the province of Pampanga, is 2.9% as against the national poverty rate of 18%. So uh, it has become the very nucleus of economic activities. And uh, our concern here it really is to be able to provide manpower for all the locators so that we give so much emphasis on the training of our graduates and coming up with a town and town program, which means that the curriculum must be alongside the, the, the industries that we have in the zone. One of the things that we also found is that uh, our locators or investors are having problems with the supply chain. And their supply chain has been affected by the pandemic. Some of those uh, suppliers are no longer in business. They, they closed down during the pandemic. And so uh, the appeal really is for the regional interdependence in the Asia Pacific region. And uh, hoping that uh, among us, uh, we can address the weaknesses of uh, the region, of the nations within the region by sharing the nations or each nation's strength. So, uh, Tom, that is uh, what we have right now. Thank you so much, Agnes. And uh, I think uh, you may find it uh, very interesting to see this area because uh, you started a kind of similar uh, project and uh, the Clark case was much uh, older, like almost uh, 30 years history. So what is your uh, quick observation about uh, the current situation in zone? You can see uh, it as a competitor or a collaborator or what, what you see? Oh, that's a very nice question because uh, the advocacy here really is uh, instead of the free ports uh, or the free port zones in every country uh, competing we should be looking at collaboration uh, because that's the only way that we can strengthen uh, the Asian Pacific region. Uh, as we have experienced, the war in Ukraine affected us. So if we're stronger and if we are conscious in our collaboration, then we can really strengthen the region. Thank you so much. That's why you came here this time. I, I understand. And uh, then uh, the second speaker is Mr. Gwen Quan Huan. Uh, he's a founder and chairman of Halcom Vietnam Company, which focuses on investment and uh, consulting in uh, infrastructure development and the social and environmental safeguards as well. He started his career as a mechanical engineer. He studied in Finland for water and environment and holds uh, an MBA from the U.S. program in Hanoi. Uh, in 2001, he founded his company, Harcom, and uh, since 2021, he is a member of the National Assembly. So he can speak not only as a business leader, but also as a politician. So one, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, you say yes, sir. Um, uh, as Tom said, that uh, mostly we focus on the green developments like the uh, water supply. As, uh, and I'm talking about uh, private centers. I have two roles, and I'm talking about uh, private centers. Um, so we more or less focus on green development like uh, green, uh, like, uh, renewable energies, water supply, and uh, sort of waste management, and some other infrastructure developments. Um, in such a way that uh, sustainable developments. As, as Tom mentioned earlier, that we work quite long, quite long time with the ODA project, like going by ADB, and uh, more or less we learn something about. And that actually, that's also a strategy of, of the country now. 
we in all of Vietnam looking for what's for uh, development, uh, sustainable development, uh, such that uh, among that the renewable energy, the trans uh, energy transfer, and the another like emissions uh, come up to the net zero in 2050, so on. All kind of things that are very interesting, but also very challenging. Um, that's maybe very interesting to come here to join the conference. The other seats being Zoom noise and economic development. Uh, at, at, at the moment, uh, Tom mentioned that earlier that the, we have one hand to keep growth, GDP uh, growth, but another one we have to keep green, uh, in, I mean, uh, protect environmental and social safeguard. Uh, how we do that? And the, especially after COVID-19 epidemic and some conflict just happened between Russia and Korea and Ukraine and uh, now Gaza ships and uh, some supply chain was interrupted. Uh, many, many other strategy of the country have to update for the for situations. Then challenging, difficult we see quite a lot. But also opportunities coming, like uh, the AI, or maybe our policy is not about AI, but uh, that coming somewhere the world becomes smaller. And the country, the relationship between the country to another country is very, very convenient. The people from this country understand more about the world. Then I think that the cooperation term comes uh, very clearly. But how to implement that? How to realize it? Then I think that uh, hopefully, so during last few days, uh, yesterday and today, and, and this session, maybe we can discuss more about the challenge, more about op opportunities, how to overcome the challenge. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Juan. And uh, I understand you studied uh, uh, water environment, uh, the water supply system in Finland. And uh, so do you see uh, Finland is uh, still very much advanced in that uh, uh, field? Yeah, Finland is one that I can say the one of the country uh, Together with the German or other country for environmental protection, they do very good. But the one thing is, small things different. I can mention here that the earlier between Vietnam and Finland the same, but the population there five years and we have one hundred million. So that the way we behave with the environmental, I think that's a little bit different. But anyway, something we we don't make a copy directly from Finland or some developed country. But I think that we can try to um, uh, nationalize the international rule and standards, update to Vietnam policies. Then I think that we can we try to match that. Of course, we cannot change one day that Vietnam to be a uh, developed country and we are very clean and so on, but we are on track. I think that hopefully we can go in the way that the developed country is going. Thank you. Thanks so much. And uh, the third speaker uh, is Yip uh, uh, Yip uh, Ha. Uh, she is uh, founder of Jedi Labs Germany. I understand her family is originated from Vietnam, but she was born and grew up in Germany and based in Munich, right? And uh, the company was uh, named after Jedi, uh, the Star Wars movie. And uh, some of them might have participated uh, in this audience uh, in her workshop here in yesterday, and including me about AI and sustainability and ESG, etc. Uh, she holds an MBA uh, from INSEAD, France, and business school, and uh, Yip was recognized as one of uh, the uh, 100 in spiritual women of Web3. And uh, oh, she is a passionate meditation teacher, uh, which uh, we uh, enjoyed, you know, how to practice meditation last uh, yesterday. And also, oh, oh, she is a poet and author of the book, uh, Beautiful Brains Change Tomorrow Today, a mindfulness manifesto and guide into entrepreneurship. Yep, the floor is yours. Good evening. It's about the most honor that I sit here in the home country of my parents and have the opportunity to share different perspectives on how we as humanity 
can make peace more profitable than war. This is the vision and the vision of our company, Jedi. And as you have heard or seen, our company is written with J3D.AI. I think the AI part is a no-brainer for everyone participating in the global economy, knowing that there is a world before and there is the world after AI, and we have crossed the point of no return. About the Web3 part, the three, my experience of training came from the blockchain world and the Web3 world. What does Web3 stand for? Web3 is the evolution of the internet, or of a society and economy enabled by the internet of tomorrow. The internet has been Web1, Web2, and we're at the verge of transitioning to Web3. Web1 was the internet where information became abundant and the costs of information or accessing information became zero, literally. I can sit in Germany, I can sit in Vietnam and use the internet to get access to the wealth and vast knowledge base. In the US, I don't need to go to Harvard or MIT anymore to access information. I'm simplifying, but that's the meaning of Web1. The impact of Web2, that's where we are at the moment. We are communicating with each other via microphone. By mobile phones, we're using social uh, creator platforms. So we have shifted from being a consumer of information to a contributor to information. And what happened was the cost of communication became nearly zero. Web 3 is the next step. It is we're moving from consumer to contributor in social media platforms to owners. So Web 3 is the internet of the world in which consumers become owners. And Jedi is trans helping us to transition into this world. What we did yesterday at the Agenda Setting Workshop was to combine the brains of the leaders of vast disciplines and interdisciplinary approach to look at opportunities and challenges that a rising economy such as Vietnam is facing. With our mission to make peace more profitable than war, we need to make collaboration more profitable than competition. That means we need to make the pie bigger. How do you make the pie bigger? The pie gets bigger when one plus one is not two, but one plus one can become three, or one hundred, or a billion. When in the interconnection, in the interconnection between humans, their entities, their businesses, there is value, and that intangible value can be leveraged and exploited. And collaboration and the methodology we use at Jedi is catalyzed. We align, we catalyze, and we amplify. I, I think I want to take a stop here. Just want you um, to take note that the future of tomorrow, the Web3, is the world of ownership. So all business models and mindset shifts that enable every human being to own a stake in a pie that gets bigger by us creating, managing, regulating the technology of tomorrow. Thank you, Yev. And I understand that uh, this time you uh, visit uh, your home country not only to participate in this uh, conference, but also you plan, plan to apply your method uh, working with uh, Vietnamese companies. Could you briefly explain about that too? So, I have in the past trained many young people from across the globe, in particular women, on how to access this new field of technology and opportunities. So one is the ability to collaborate, that we can do with Jedi. But the second one is actually how to make use of technology, how, to, how do we actually build a basic level of participation in technologies of tomorrow, and that is literacy. So in our workshops that we offer, we offer training for literacy, training for the leadership skills of tomorrow, and opportunities to collaborate, to co-create at the world of tomorrow. And I have seen that certain skills that I have learned during my studies in the western parts of the world, in America, um, in, in, in Germany, are lacking here. Systems, thinking skills in the higher education, the management, and this is what we offer. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We will of course discuss about these uh, you know, AI issues later. 
and uh, uh, not the last but not the least speaker is Mr. Shito Hori. Uh, Mr. Hori is a Japanese businessman, educator, and venture capitalist. He is the founder and the president of Grovis Corporation and Grovis University. Uh, also, he is the founder and managing partner of Grovis Capital Partners. A Harvard MBA graduate and former Sumitomo Corporation employee, Mr. Hori established Grovis Management School in 1992. Grovis started a full-time MBA program in English in 2012 and expanded to offer an online MBA program in 2015. In addition to uh, being a leader of business, educa business education in Japan, Mr. Hori founded uh, the venture capital firm, Grovis Capital Partners, in 1996. Uh, the firm has since managed seven funds with over uh, two billion US dollars. So, Horizon, uh, the floor is yours. Hello, Vietnam. Hello, Vietnam. I'm so happy to be back, and I'm so happy to be back to Horizon's Asia meeting, right? So, about Asian growth, I came up with five keywords. The first keyword is peace. We took the peace for granted until last year. However, the situation in Ukraine and Israel, we have to face the reality in Asia for the peace. We have issues in North Korea and also Taiwan. For the peace, we need to engage the U.S. and we have to think about what, which is U.S., Japan, India, and Australia, plus one, South Korea, for the stability of the peace in this region. Second is political integration. The largest economy, the large, largest country in Asia is run by dictatorship, turned by President Biden dictatorship. Other countries are mostly run in a democratic ways. And those political integration is political integration needs needed simply because there is a dispute between US and China. And therefore, for the stability of Asia, we have to have a good coordination with Japan, China, Vietnam, China, and Malaysia, and China. And we have to engage China so that we have a good stability. Third key one will be uh, economic integration, market integration. We have ASEAN, RCEP, and also TPP. We need to have harmonization of regulation and free flow of capital, knowledge, data, and people are going to be needed. And those three are the infrastructure for the Asian growth. Two other. One is about education. I started a business school in Japan, which has become the largest business school. We are bigger than second, third, and fourth combined, KO Wasele Hitosubashi. We are one of the largest in Asia. And what is needed is education and also skill development. Most of the universities are quite bureaucratic, and therefore they could not cope with the changes of the needs of the uh, education. This skill is really needed, more engineering, more software, and also more about AI. And those are not being adjusted or adapted in universities. Recently, I came up with a new word called Technobate. Technobate stands for technology plus innovate. <laughs> technobate. And I thought about technovation, technology plus innovation. But that word is taken by Panasonic. So, I have, you know, so therefore, Technobate is the word that we are using. We need Technobate education for the reskilling of the workforce and also people in Asia for the Asian growth. Fifth key one is what I call unleashing potential entrepreneurs and for the stable growth of the Asian region. I run a business, I run a business at the same time running a venture capital. More than seven hundred million dollars, more than two million dollars combined, seven funds. We are investing in startups in Japan. And recently the climate also the environment has changed in Japan. Recent article of Financial Times talked about Japan being the new Japan is more entrepreneurial. I have five sons, all of them will work for themselves, like they want to be a startup. They, I used to work for Sumitomo Corporation, but not in long run. But you know, it's going to be more entrepreneurial. So for the Asian world, we need a peace, political integration, economic integration, and then education reskilling. And at least at last, I think we need more about entrepreneurship. Thank you so much, Horizon. It's really great. And uh, do you uh, receive some uh, Vietnamese students to your university as well? Yeah, we have quite a few students from Vietnamese. In ASEAN, the largest is from Thailand, the second largest is from Philippines, and third is Indonesia, Singapore, and also Vietnamese. And uh, we have not only part time MBA, 
for those who are studying in Japan. We are teaching both in English and Japanese, and part time and online here so that anybody can join our VA program anywhere in the world. At the same time, we have started full time VA in 2012, therefore, uh, and there are quite a few uh, Vietnamese as well as Filipino students coming over. That's great. Thank you so much all the participants. Now, there are so many issues uh, raising up uh, about uh, regional you know, geopolitical issues and also uh, economic, uh, you know, economic development and uh, you know, uh, sustainable sustainability and also entrepreneurship and AI and education, uh, something else. So I don't know if uh, the rest of 30 minutes is enough to talk about these all issues. But let me start on many, maybe the hardest issue is geopolitical tension, as uh, uh, Orison said, that the US-China tension really affects the region and uh, it may change the whole uh, picture in the region if something happens. So, uh, but at the same time, you know, uh, uh, many ASEAN countries uh, try to be neutral, to have good relations with the US and also with uh, uh, China. So maybe, uh, Juan, can you uh, briefly explain about the Vietnamese position about this US-China tension? Because I understand that uh, Vietnam, uh, as a trading partner, I think uh, both uh, US and China are uh, biggest uh, partners. So you cannot uh, neglect one of the each. So what do you think about this? You know, as, as I mentioned at the beginning, that I'm coming here for, uh, from the private sector. <coughs> but uh, all the Vietnam, I, we understand that uh, we want to observe a long time with the world, not for peaceful, like, a, like a, the gentleman uh, uh, Joseph mentioned uh, the keyword that I highlight up very much. Uh, then we, we suffer that, then we know that we just live in the peaceful uh, development, and we want to make friends to all. All the country in the world, we don't define either US or China or Japan, all the friends, whoever support Vietnam and want to be friend with Vietnamese people, with Vietnamese country, then we love and we want to cooperate. We don't, we don't definitely criticize that who come from that in this country. That's that first one. Another one that, um, you know, in the global states, so compete each other. Then stage by stage, we cannot say that we are, we are following this direction or another direction. Of course, a country we define, we select the direction how to develop it. But in case by case, we do the business, we have to base on the institutions. We cannot say that uh, we do with this guy, we don't do with another one. We just how to approach the win win situation, so bring benefits for mutual. For, for both party, then we do that, and we don't do anything to make it harmful for another for the first party. Then we go. So you know that's the principle. But to implement it, to realize that sometimes we need some tool, but we cannot say that we can do it very well. But we're trying to get it better and better. Thank you so much, and Agnes, and you said something about uh, supply chain, and it might be affected. You know, China and the US tension uh, are growing. So, what about uh, your observation from the Philippines? Uh, well, first of all, uh, let me just uh, touch on the uh, geopolitical situation because uh, the Philippines is, uh, well, the, the uh, South China Sea is actually uh, within the Philippine territory that South is our position. And uh, it might be different from the other countries because the first and, uh, thing that our national government is doing is to strengthen the defense of the Philippines from the aggression of anyone, uh, regardless of whether you're a Western country or you're also um, Asian, so that's it. And the other one is that uh, we have existing agreements uh, with and partnerships with uh, uh, the U.S. and therefore our president is respecting those agreements and so uh, we're into the joint military exercises and uh, so you see also Americans coming in but it doesn't mean that because of all these things 
we are against one or the other. The cutting edge there is whether it will negatively affect the Philippines. Is it an aggression to the Philippine territory? So that's the cutting edge. And, uh, and uh, the, other, uh, the other point is on the supply chain. Yes, uh, we know that uh, there are some materials and supplies coming from China, but that's the reason why I mentioned about strengthening the interdependence of the different countries in the Asia-Pacific region. So that if one thing happens with one country and uh, nobody suffers uh, uh, extremely to a point that they will be closing down businesses. That is the kind of interdependence so that the weaknesses of one country may be addressed and solved by sharing the strengths of the other member nations in the Asia Pacific region. Thank you. And just for that, uh, I want to ask Mr. Hori, Hori san, because uh, you know, uh, on the contrary to the wisdom of uh, ASEAN, so not, uh, you know, leaning on to the one side, but uh, Japan has uh, one of the strongest allies with the United States. We have to be uh, with the United States, uh, not only politically, but also some, you know, economically as well. But from the uh, business point of view, what uh, the Japanese business leaders see the current situation uh, between China and the United States, and what about the Japanese company's approach to the Chinese market? Well, uh, business person has to be pragmatic, and therefore we should not be engaged in politics. And therefore we have to take everything for granted, and so that we will be able to do everything. If there is a big company in the US or China, we will think about China plus one. And if there is an issue with the export to China, we have to think about the area to expand. And also, uh, so in terms of business people, uh, we will not oppose to the situation. We will not oppose to the government. We will just do whatever the government has told us to do. That's our business person. And then we will do whatever on these conditions, because if all the conditions are same and equal to other competitors, then we have to be the best of it. However, in terms of this situation at this moment, I'm not talking about from business person perspectives, but we're talking about Japanese. And the situation in North Korea and also the situation in South China Sea and East China Sea. Those are issues. And, uh, you know, in case of East China Sea, Japan is engaged. And North Korea, Japan, Korea. And in case of South China Sea, Vietnam, and also Vietnam, Philippines are all uh, uh, involved. And the issue of from Clark City, and the, there used to be a US based in Clark City, and that has been a stable, uh, stable stability for the this region. But I heard that from, since the withdrawal of the US bases from Clark City, there has been a vacuum. And then there is a way for China to come into South China Sea. And that is creating uh, you know, lots of uh, 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 certainty in this region. And uh, uh, that's the thing that we have to be really looking at. Here. However, as a business person, you know, all those things are being planted. We have to think about what to be done for Asian growth. And that's you know, what I will be talking about if I will be told to be have a next year time. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, maybe you want some, uh, some follow-up? Yeah, I, I like the rest of it. I hear from uh, Agnes that uh, the, the inter-cooperation uh, between, between the country, but I think that we clearly that uh, very totally agree with uh, Jusito Sun that uh, we have to get a confidence between the country and the country. We have to live in, in a peaceful way. And if the country don't make the So much because in Japan, in some media reports, that uh, you know, uh, uh, when we see the situation in Ukraine, uh, it's really an, an analogy of the future uh, uh, situation in China and Taiwan. So, the uh, Chinese, uh, you know, crush with Taiwan uh, should be the issue of not only like the issue of if, but it, it should be the issue of when. Uh, so, the kind of you know, escalating uh, uh, theory uh, is talking about, but uh, at the same time, we have to be 
realistic and try to calm down the situation as much as possible. And uh, uh, if, uh, because you are uh, uh, in Munich, so far away from the region ordinarily, but uh, in, in a way you are close to the situation in Ukraine. So, uh, uh, is, do you see any uh, anything affected by the recent situation uh, in the Ukraine and Russia conflict in your business? How, how do you see uh, the business leaders in Germany uh, see this political you know, or tension affects the economic uh, dimensions? In an interconnected global world, there is no way to escape these conflicts. I would rather focus still on the opportunities because the situation is as it is and assuming for the moment we as a company being a taker of the situation rather than a shaper of situation. What kind of opportunities are there? In Germany we are seeing a huge influx of Ukrainian technological talent. We see um, talent that has been trained in using technology. In particular we are seeing talent that is female. In Germany we don't have a lot of women participation in technological areas. It seems that in countries like uh, Russia, Ukraine, um, Estonia, any kind of countries, even in Vietnam, where the divide between men and women, culturally and um, economically, is not that strong. A lot of women seem to participate in technological areas. When we look at the markets, global capital markets, five, eight of the global um, most capitalized companies are tech-driven companies. But right? so when, for example, women do not participate in these companies, in the technology field, then they are not partaking in the economic upsides that these technologies bring to society. When you do not accumulate wealth in any assets, you cannot shape the environment in a strategic way. Hence, I always get back to this idea that we need equity in economy and society, because that also means shaping the future direction of our world of humanity with all diverse perspectives. That means with better intelligence more holistic intelligence. Thank you, thank you, Rip. And uh, just she mentioned uh, something about the gender issues, and uh, I understand that, that the Philippines, you have already uh, at least uh, two yeah, uh, female president recently, Aquino and uh, Arroyo, okay. and uh, you serve as uh, secretary. Uh, so uh, how about uh, you see the gender equality issue in the region from the advanced country well, I think, uh, well, yeah, uh, I recommend, thank you for recognizing that uh, there, is, there was so much uh, efforts on gender equality and uh, as of this time, uh, the opportunities for women have really gone further than expected uh, and putting the women at the highest uh, post of the land as presidents. And now, how do we see that in the region? I think it's also growing, growing towards gender equality. And there is such a realization, uh, even in technology, we're seeing more women. And uh, the first step should really be in the academe. It's opening the academe to more women, encouraging, uh, and encouragement should be given by as, uh, as low as the village leaders and on to the town and it really depends on both uh, the curriculum of the academic and the business opportunities, the employment opportunities. So if we have these two, uh, I see no reason why uh, the advancement of gender equality will be present in all of the countries in the region. Thank you so much. And in that sense, I think Japan is really far behind. And according to their latest announcement by the uh, Economic Forum, uh, Japan is uh, 125th out of 146 countries. So, Horizon, uh, uh, do you see this gender inequality in Japan can be an obstacle to the uh, economic growth? You know, uh, I don't think the issue of gender equality is a problem any longer in Japan. If you look at the uh, female work participation in Japan is bigger than the US. And therefore, more and more female are working in, uh, in business in Japan. And at the same time, more and more female are becoming director and manager. And if you look at the 
the lobby committee. If you are a 30 or 40 people, you can join. If you are 30 or 40 male, you cannot join. Because not so many male positions are taken by all the people. And uh, therefore, uh, if you are male, female, you have more chances to become more important in the, uh, in the business and in politics. That's actually happening. And therefore, I'm not worried about the agenda equality of Japan. I'm going to talk about Asian growth uh, more. Because I talked about politics, you know, uh, the role of politics is to bring peace and political integration and also economic integration. Don't be a leader and education and also investment. And those two, education investment will be jointly done by the private sector and also the public sector. And the business, as a business person, I think the most important thing for a business person is to grow your company to become number one in the world. And the, one, the reason why I'm saying the world is that if you are not number one in the world, the bigger companies will come into your market and take it. And what's happening in the internet world? There is only one. We not take all. In Japan, mostly you know, um, search is Google, and commerce is mostly Amazon, and social media is Facebook, and also smartphones are Apple or you know, Google. You know. and, uh, and also OS is mostly Microsoft, and government is dominating. So if you are number one, they used to be number one players in Japan, but those are being beaten up by government and those big players in the US. And what I said, therefore the region of Asia has become you know, not meaning any longer because of internet, there is no boundary in Asia. So we used to say that we want to become number one in Asia, but we decided not to talk about Asia. We have to become number one in the world, but we have to compete against Harvard or Stanford. How can we do it? Technology will give you chances to become number one. And if you've got all the technology, you know, the champions will be changed. It used to be, let's say, the market stores, now Amazon, or Rakuten, or Alibaba, new startups. It used to be TV, like CBS, ABC, and now it's a YouTube or, or Netflix startups. It used to be Toyota, now it's a Tesla or, or, uh, or, uh, or Uber, it's also a startup. And AI is also open AI, it's not. So if you use the technology, and then the old players will be beaten up and the newcomers will come up. So I will guarantee you that the next leader in medicine education is going to be not Harvard, it's going to be Globus. And Globus will be number one in the world. Thanks so much. Like so so cool. Cool. I think uh, many of the Globus ones now uh, uh, pay interest to uh, his uh, Globus school and uh, come to Japan and study more. You, know, you can study online, and I can just uh, uh, you know, add something to what he said about uh, the gender equality issue in Japan. Because more, uh, most of the reason why Japan is uh, ranked behind was uh, the uh, female political participation is less than the other uh, countries. So uh, it, it, it's exactly right that in the business leaders and business sectors, uh, female participation are uh, really growing and change a lot. Thank you so much. So I think uh, uh, about the AI and the technology, uh, you uh, had some uh, reaction or comment to what uh, Polisan said. Well, what, from your, your viewpoint, what is uh, uh, necessary? Uh, how to utilize the AI and the new technologies for the Asian growth? That was a topic we discussed yesterday, three and a half hours in our agenda setting workshop. And the interesting topic we asked ourselves during our discussion is, or I, I, I would summarize it for you because you don't want to go through three and a half hours of discussion. But the key answer was the question, how could Vietnam, as a local economy here, leapfrog something participants, local participants would call Taipan, like becoming another version of Taipan and another version of Japan, together Taipan, leapfrogging. How so Taiwan is Taiwan and Japan? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Two inspirational economies for the local participants. And what we came to conclude is that there are certain strategic frameworks to use. One is to say, how can we play to our strength? It makes strength um, in, in a world of many crises, right? How can you not only be resilient? We spoke about economic resilience having a stake in each other's business and thereby creating peace. But how can we actually be anti-fragile? Anti-fragile means to benefit from adversity. So now how do you use your strength to benefit from any kind of adversity that comes in? And 
and when we look at what AI technology actually requires, there are many different components when we look at AI. One could say, okay, one of the main drivers of the technological evolution is hardware manufacturing. Does Vietnam want to become the next Taiwan? Probably that's not that interesting. Where is actually the future um, economic value growth driver? And that, and also, what is the underlying skill set that you need to have? Then you can break it down and look into data. Any kind of AI-driven solution depends on the quality and availability of data. Now, we can say, wow, Vietnam might have an advantage because data privacy regulation is not that strong here. So, for European and Western um, companies, they can go to this 100 million market and potentially to the 600 million um, users market to leverage on that. The question is, is that the right strategy? What could you possibly do to make data an asset, not at the expense of the citizens? Right? How can you create a framework, a policy, a governance framework, in which you set the grounds for using data to the benefits of those who are generous enough to provide the data? Vietnam is a very data-rich economy. People here are willingly, voluntarily offering their data. But what can governments, for example, do to enable those who provide these data, the young population of Vietnam, the region, to benefit from this data? So data monetization requires certain regulatory frameworks. And these are discussions where we can see that it needs governance, it needs policy, not only to bring in the Western capital, but actually to think about what are the prerequisites to make those in my country benefit from then the second, of course, the usage. What kind of skills do I need to consume? But as I mentioned in the beginning, it's not about consuming. It's about how can I own my data and own the development of technologies that create value for the economic market. And having said that, I, I, I think when we think about AI, there is a lot of talk about the next level generative AI, but economically and pragmatically, Maybe we start with looking at data as an asset, data automation, data labeling, data processing. It, it's quite difficult to become the next MIT in Vietnam, but you can be the data hub when you think of Silicon Valley, how it was built. The, the value was in the picks and shovels business. So what are picks and shovels that Vietnam can actually um, train? How can it deploy its young population, sustainability practices, to build the economy of the future, to leap from Taipei. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, of course, uh, there are so many issues to be discussed, but uh, now time is almost limited. But uh, oh, Agnes, uh, I do remember when I first time visited uh, your country in 1987 uh, in Manila, I went to uh, even see the Smoky Mountain. At that time, I think environmental issue has been a lot changed in your country. So, uh, in terms of uh, environmental and green uh, issues. Uh, could you uh, share with us your uh, cooperation do something about these issues as well? Well, uh, from then, from the time that we've been there, and up to now, we have really changed because uh, uh, environment is very, it is very much in the middle of governance. In fact, uh, for our uh, building, uh, uh, building codes, we already have the green building code. So that's uh, because it's easy to be advocating anything. However, we must have the framework, just like uh, what you have emphasized. The framework should be uh, incorporated in legislation. So that's what we have. And uh, we have moved fast and we have moved far. And so this will also ensure the sustainability of programs. Thank you so much. And uh, before final uh, remark, move, moving to the final remarks of each, but uh, maybe I just open the floor. Any, uh, if you have uh, the audience, if you have any uh, specific questions to any one of the, uh, the panelists, can I maybe, uh, if you have any questions so far? No. Okay, please. Could you identify yourself and ask uh, uh, questions uh, to uh, specify to, to whom? Um, I'm from Japan. Uh, 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 I'm from Japan.
Just a just moment, the microphone is coming to you. Thank you very much. I, um, I am from Tokyo Corporation. I am actually now from Dekatex Tokyo Corporation, doing a township development here in Beijing New City, in cooperation with Dekatex IDC Group, who is organizing this for us this event. And now, um, since 2012, we are building a township here. And I want to ask uh, Mr. Hori, um, as building a township from 2012, now it's 10, 11 years old, this township, and we want to make this city a city of education too. Um, in terms of the collaboration with uh, foreign companies or the global companies from now, for Vietnam or this big new city to develop more, how do you think we should collaborate with the foreign companies, with the international companies, to make value which can be number one in the world? Thank you. I think the key to success in building education uh, hub is to bring the best and brightest uh, education institution from the world, and it's not easy. And uh, uh, because uh, first of all, you have to have some density in terms of population, and you have the best of population, but you need to have a, a global uh, participation of students as well as the faculty have to come in, and you have to create that. Singapore has been doing a good job in in attracting uh, international institutions to come to Singapore and actually have a campus uh, over there. I think the key is to uh, you know, as in introduce and attract as many uh, educational institutions, the best and brightest over here, and provide subsidies for faculty and also uh, because recently Japanese, uh, there's a great range of Japanese professors going to Dubai or Abu Dhabi or maybe Singapore because they are paying, being paid much higher. And if you pay higher, better environment, and better infrastructure of uh, research, people come here. And then you have to uh, convince the government to provide subsidies and also uh, incentives for the institution to come over and provide the same time scholarship for students to come over. If you can do that, you can create that. But if you do it, uh, like it's also, it won't be successful. You have to be bold and at the same time, so dynamic to it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so, well, I guess, yeah. I just add something because in part uh, Freeport Zone, we have at least two big international schools and we have the State University of the Philippines there also and we have three other schools. Now I think the reason why it was the schools came over is because there was a creation of appetite for it. In other words, there was a demand that was created since uh, the, uh, we provided, uh, we cre recreated uh, Clark also as a place for the family to stay. So uh, it's, it should be symbiotic. The demand, and it's not, it's not easy, and it's not uh, inexpensive to be putting up international schools. Thank you, thank you, Agnes. So now time is almost up, but uh, each one of you maybe ask uh, maybe 30 or 40 seconds to say something about the hopeful future for Asia. Uh, so, uh, one, please. So, uh, time is limited, but uh, I just want every one of us to understand that uh, now we are at the global stage and we cannot do anything alone, especially for the, for the big uh, thing like the climate change or emission and, and so on. But uh, we need the cooperation, the fair cooperation, but equal cooperation. I mean here that uh, for developed country, you go beyond some developing country, and if we just ask about environmental protections, uh, why the poor country, developing country, we still consider about the road developments, I mean GDP, then we have tried to keep the balance. Then we need the support from developed country, either human resources, like, uh, like you uh, just mentioned, well, education, knowledge, technologies, and also capital, and special thing, the management scheme. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so if... Sustainability to me is the ability to sustain, to sustain peace. And in order to sustain peace, we need collaboration and integration. I welcome everyone who wants to learn more about how to use collective intelligence to its best to catalyze this 
economic integration and collaboration. Come find me and we can have a discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. And the words on this. Okay, I'm so glad to be here. And talking about AI, I think AI will commoditize everything. And so that it will become standardized. And after the standardized commodity, the efficiency, productivity improve, I think people will start wondering about what the people is. And I think the future of HR will, I think one of the future growth will come up to entertainment. Sony, the profit of $8 million, 60% come from entertainment, game, music, and also video, and movies as well. So think about the K-pop is, is creating so much wealth into Korea. I think after the investment, because we do venture capital investment, innovation will become more commoditized, more standardized, and could be harmful in the future. I think people will think about what is happiness, and what it, think about what is people, and why are we born, and that kind of you know, things will be the center of the growth in the future. Thank you. Finally, Agnes, please. We need technology in business and in learning our businesses. However, we shouldn't forget that the human factor, the human being, must never be uh, out of this equation. So we have technology, but it must be human-centric technology. Uh, second point is that we need the collaboration of all nations, especially to strengthen the region. And the third very important point is we need trans, uh, trans, uh, for me, trans uh, leadership. We need a transformational leadership here in the region and in every nation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Of course, it's not enough to find a quick solution in just one hour session. But I hope uh, this discussion uh, will give you a clue uh, at least and the peace and harmony will pre prevail for the future in Asia. Uh, so, uh, finally, I would like to, we would like to thank uh, Dr. Frank Jürgen Richter and also Horace staffs and the Bindun uh, Regional Government for hosting this event. And uh, we are sure that we, we will meet again as uh, soon. So, thank you and happy holidays. Now, the session closes.